This episode today is brought to you by Audible.com. One of my absolute favorite books right now is The 12 Week Year. It is a phenomenal book and I highly recommend that you check it out. The concept behind the book is that you can get more done in 12 weeks than others can do in 12 months. We're actually going through this in my mastermind. A few, you know, a few other entrepreneurs and myself, we meet every week online and we keep each other accountable. And this book has totally changed the way my business has been performing. And I highly, highly, highly recommend you check it out. If you are in sales, you must read The 12 Week Year. To find more information, to get a free audio download of this book, you can go to audibletrial.com slash TSE. Again, audibletrial.com slash TSE. I promise you, you'll be totally blown away. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to another great episode of the Sales Evangelist Podcast. I'm your host, Donald Kelly, the Sales Evangelist. And I'm so excited for another great episode. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And on this episode, I have two awesome guests. Their names are Jim McCormick and also Marianne Carinch. They wrote, co-wrote this book called Body Language Sales Secret, how to read prospects and decode subconscious signals to get results and close the deal. Phenomenal book. And we're going to talk about that today because here's the thing that I've come to realize is that we have a hidden language amongst us as sales professionals and also just as people, right? You know, you've heard statistics about how you do more if you're talking through your body than you do through your actual words. So if that's the case, why in the world are we left in the dark, man? As a sales professional, I guarantee you're going to really enjoy this conversation. They're going to give you some key insights, some key ideas on how these tie to different ways of selling, different means. We're going to go over five of them particularly. And man, these guys, they know what they're talking about. They're a fun group. So I won't take up much more time. Let's go ahead and dive into the content. Welcome to the show, Jim and Marianne. Hello, Donald. (laughs) I am so excited to have you both on the episode today because I know we're going to have some great conversation because oftentimes as sales professional, we don't realize that there's a hidden language that most of us don't pay attention to. And I'm not talking about French or Spanish, or I'm not even talking about sales, but it's our body language and specifically how this can help us improve the way we sell or may make us not sell so well. So before, before we dive into all the fun stuff and start talking about this, I'd love for you guys to tell us a little bit more about you individually. Let's go ahead and start with you, Jim. Tell us a little bit more about you. Hey, Donald. Jim McCormick here. I'm the author of a number of books. I am a professional skydiver. I'm an organizational consultant. I have been in a selling role in one fashion or another throughout my entire career, whether it's been selling ideas or selling products or um, selling for organizations in order to advance their cause. So this is a topic that's, that's very near and dear to me. I've also been in some corporate executive positions, and I do a fair amount of executive coaching and CEO presentations continuing in my practice. Nice. Now about you, Marianne? Well, Donald, I have been writing about body language and studying body language intensely for 13 years, and it's a build on what I had known before, which uh, is theater. So, you know, in theater, you have to know how to do body language so that you can present the right emotion. And then I sort of built on that by collaborating with someone who's a body language expert and then, you know, got together with Jim to focus it on sales. And, you know, I'm glad you did because I really feel that there's so, there's so much there that we can discuss and so many insights and probably from your years of studies that you can share with us, you know, the sales professionals and Jim, again, Marrying those two is a power in that. But let's go even just start talking about it. Why should sales professionals even worry about this stuff anyways? Do we even, is it even that big of a deal when it comes towards body language and improving sales? Or is this more of what nice to have? What are some of your feelings on that? Donald, I think it's, it's an absolute necessity. And you, you touched on it well when you got it started. There's so much of our communication is nonverbal. And that's what inspired us to write the book. When we're interacting with people in person, significant part of the message we're sending them and the message they're sending to us is coming in a nonverbal fashion. And the sales professional that doesn't is not aware of that on two sides is at a significant disadvantage. And Donald, when I say two sides, in the book, we present an opportunity and a means by which to assess the messages that you're receiving and just as critically, the messages that you're sending. Mm. What about you, Marion? What are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely, that a lot of what we do that is important communication is involuntary body language. And so what we try to alert people to is, what signals are you giving as a salesperson that you may not want to be giving? 
and what signals do you really want to give and how do people interpret you, as well as what are you picking up from other people in their resistance to you, in their liking of you? Are they accepting you? So we go through a lot of the nuances of that and help people close deals a lot more effectively. What are some of the involuntary body language that we may want to avoid or things that, well, salespeople probably are doing right now from you, you guys' experience? How about we start with you on, on that, Marianne? Well, a lot of times we make other people nervous or people make us nervous and we don't realize what glitchy behavior we have when we have a little bit of stress or emotion. And so we need to know what do we do? Rub our fingers together, uh, twiddle our hair or what, you know, what sort of maneuvers do we give to give off that are sort of self-soothing gestures? And what are other people doing? When you see tension come into a sales relationship like that, something's not quite right. You want the person to be calm and you want there to be an ease between the two of you. So that's what we're aiming for. What are your thoughts on that, Jim? I would love to get your feelings on that. Well, this is typical of how this whole process works. Marianne has a tremendous in-depth knowledge. Mine is much more su- superficial, and, and which, I, which I think is good because what I focus on, it's a simple question. Well, what level of engagement do we have with our prospect? And the things that Marianne mentioned are all indicators of, of whether we are or are not engaged, but I'm looking for engagement and connection. Are we authentic? Do we, are we making eye contact? Because the prospect can genuinely discern whether we're present or not. And by being present and focused on them, and a, such a significant part of it is listening effectively to them, that makes the connection that we want to make that can lead to the relationship that can lead to the sale. And it's interesting you mentioned eye contact too. I mean, that I find that when I was a new seller, I didn't look anyone in the eyes. I was afraid because <laughs> one, I didn't have confidence in myself. Two, I didn't have confidence in the product. And three, I felt lower than my the people that I was trying to sell to, right? You know, me going into a meeting with an executive or on a phone call with them. Like this person is running a million, multi-million dollar organization. I can't even spell million. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but And part of and, and, right, and well, what, we, what we do when we're going through the book, after we've trained people on a lot of the aspects of body language and sales, then we talk about five different sales approaches in which they can apply it. And one of them that comes to mind as you're speaking to that is the expertise sale and having confidence when you go in the door that you actually know more than the people that are buying from you and you have something to offer them on the the expertise scale. Right. Also, when you change your body language to have the body language of confidence, it does something to your head. It really makes you feel better. You feel more powerful. So there are some power poses that we talk about too that really help you project confidence. And it's then it's through and through. You feel it yourself and you project it. You mentioned these five different sales situations. Is it okay if we tackle some of those? Or you guys can tell us what those are at least? Yeah, absolutely. The five that we dive into and go into great detail on how they relate to using body language are relationship selling, solution selling, expertise selling, ROI, return on investment selling, and fear selling. Well, let's talk about some of those and and see how those cope with it as well. If if it's okay if we maybe at least hit up on a few of them in this first half of this episode here. And I would love to, for you to get, go a little bit further and tell us a little bit more about this relationship selling side and how that can tie with body language. Um, why don't we start with you, Jim? Absolutely. In a relationship selling environment, you're doing exactly that. You're working to create a relationship. You're not going straight for a sale. You're not even focused on a product so much. You're focused on establishing a relationship by asking some genuine questions, a staying away from a transactional mindset, which means immediately jumping to the close. Your goal in a, in a relationship environment is to create a long term relationship that doesn't just result in a single transaction, but results in transactions over an extended period of time. Because at the end of the day, people do business with people they trust and people they enjoy. And during that, in, in that setting, it's critically important that you really set the sale initially a bit aside and invest some time in creating a relationship, just like you'd create a personal relationship. It's not something that happens immediately. And Marianne can speak to how body language influences that process. Sure. Well, you want the body language of trust, mutual trust. So you have to have some openness. The open body language means that you don't have your front protected. So you don't have things crossed in front of you or held in front of you. You're not putting barriers between you and the other person. That's one of the fundamentals. And there there are so many other things that indicate that you 
want to connect with the person. So you open up your body language, don't clench your hands, that kind of thing. And do use the eye contact. It's very important. What about when it comes towards solution selling? Imagine a lot of our folks who are selling software probably falls in this category a little bit. Of course, in this in solution selling environment, you're not selling a product, you're selling a solution that, can, that happens to be a product that can benef- benefit the individual, that benefit the, the customer. So obviously, you have to do a fair amount of genuine, authentic investigating in that process, which means, most importantly, you are showing an interest in them and you're showing an interest in the challenges and the problems that they need to solve. They can readily discern by your level of questioning and your level of engagement if you're sincerely taking an interest in their challenges that, and how you might be able to solve them, or you're just asking perfunctory questions because you're trying to get to a sale. Hmm. Marianne, how would that tie with the body language side of the house? You are showing active listening. Active listening means that you would be leaning toward the person, most likely, that you'll nod occasionally because you want the person to know that you're with them, that you would continue to, you know, look engaged in the sense that you have focus on that person, and that there's probably some mirroring going on. So you are adopting a not, you're not mimicking what the person is doing, but you're coming very close to adopting the same type of posture so that person feels comfortable with you and knows that you're really engaged in whatever information he or she is sharing with you. Donald, let me speak to that mirroring concept versus mimicking because I think that's really important. Sometimes people have read in sales books, oh, you're supposed to mirror your prospect and they can end up looking absolutely ridiculous because if the if the prospect crosses their right leg then they cross their right leg and similar things like that and 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 it, and it looks like they're they're absolutely like a puppet that's not the point at all the mirroring is a way for you to gain control of the situation if they walk in the room your prospect walks in the room and they're high energy they're highly distracted they're struggling to focus you go to their where their energy level is and then you bring them with you and you calm them down. Similarly, if they're in a in they're in a calm place where they're just you know they're extremely low energy, you match them there and then bring them up to a level that will help them to focus on the discussion that you're having. That's a completely different process than just simply leaving them where they are. And you can see how by doing so, you very gently, without being manipulative, bring them to a common point that's going to work best for both of you. Yeah, and you can I mean you can see this probably in some other situations like you know sometimes. You- you find, I remember in high school, it, well, parents always tell you, you become those that you're around the most. <laughs> and you can probably right. see that same idea where you be, you start following the mannerism and things of those that you spend those times with. Um, and I can see how definitely this can help out in a selling situation where you are, you're going in kinship or in oneness with those you're trying to build relationship with and, and to sell with. But here's a question I have. What if you're selling on a phone? We're talking virtually right now. How does that, does this even matter to me if, uh, as a sales professional, if I'm doing stuff remotely? Oh, absolutely. Just for one second, body language is also your tone of voice. It's how you say things. So, you know, the comfort level in your voice, whether you're strident or, you know, comfortable or whatever, all of those different ways of handling your voice are all part of your body language. Love it. Were you going to say something towards that, Jim? Just say, you know, simply stated that pace and tone of somebody's voice gives you some significant insights as to where they're at. And while obviously we prefer to be working in, a, in an in-person environment, those are critical things to be aware of. Let's talk about the expert idea now. Let, and how does the expert selling, this, this selling scenario, I'm selling solution, what kind of body language should we pay attention to, Marianne, when, in this type of uh, atmosphere? Your body language of confidence is very important. And, you know, actually, this is one that Jim is very, very good at. Expertise selling is, is, a, is a good, it's a sweet spot for him. So I'm going to let him take over. When you're in an expertise selling environment, you need to exude credibility because you, what you're doing, you're making the point, as we all know, in an expertise sale that you know more than them, but you're not going to be arrogant about it. But it, to the extent they quickly discern that you truly have an expertise because you probably have a familiarity with your product or service that's far beyond that which they'll ever develop. It puts you in a position of control and it gives you the, op- but it's the credibility that you need to present. And that means you have an open presentation. You're sitting upright. It might be a matter of how you're positioning yourself within the room, 
whether you have barriers between you and them, but you have that, as Marianne put it, it's a, that air of confidence and certainty and credibility that you are speaking from a position of authority. Hmm. The, it's, I think this is a, and it's a very important part there because I felt, well, over the years with the podcast, I found myself getting more speaking opportunities and I have a speaking coach and she always emphasized to me about the, the idea that, because I, I was, well, just first off, I was, when I started doing the podcast and started speaking, I didn't feel that I was an expert. <laughs> I felt that I was just doing something. But the people in the audiences, the people that I was working with, people that I was sharing stuff with, they found that it was, you know, was benefit to them and they saw me as the expert. And I think that's, uh, it's an important part where we need to, as uh, sometimes, you know, we need to improve our own, how can we improve our self, our belief in ourself and to, I guess, improve that confidence when we do those power poses or when we do something over and over again? What are some of the things that you guys see can help us to, to gain to that level of confidence and sell on that expert level, it's an it's, solution selling is an expert is an intellectual exercise. So you have <laughs> to be able to have it is you have to have the knowledge going in, and then the knowledge then feeds the confidence. As far as the body language components of that, Marianne is much better qualified to speak to that. Wait, well, let me start with something that I'm really picking up strongly from you, Donald, which is that the reason one reason why people would listen to you and want to listen to you is you exude warmth, so, so much warmth in your voice that you sound authentic. You sound like you're telling the truth, like you really are curious about what other people are saying. And so what that does is that makes you also sound very confident. You're connecting in a way that is very robust. And that's one of the reasons why people would want to listen to you. Now, translate that into a sales environment. If somebody can get that same warmth and genuine interest across, then the person to whom you're selling something feels like you really care. You're really listening. You're really interested. All of those things, whether you're doing it on the phone or in person, that will help you sound like an expert and it will sound and you'll sound truthful and people will want to talk to you more. Mm, love that. That's a great, great point on that. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words there. I'll make sure to keep that noted and, and keep doing what I'm doing then. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and, yes. and you can see, Donald, that sets you up perfectly for the relationship sale and also the expertise sale because you're, you're building that relationship, which you obviously have a natural ability to do based on the warmth that Marianne's identified. Mm, I like that. I like that. I'm, I'm, I'm putting a little note down. I need, to, I need to talk to you guys a little bit more often. <laughs> <laughs> This stuff is going good so far. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, Jim and Marianne are going to continue to share with us some key insights and some ideas that can help you perform better in reading people as a top performing sales rep. You're listening to the Sales Evangelist Podcast, and I'm your host, Donald Kelly, the Sales Evangelist. As you know, I always push things of value, and one of the things that I absolutely love, one of the tools in my arsenal that helps me to perform well each and every day is Audible. I would highly recommend that you check out Audible. It's a powerful tool because here's what happens. If you're like me, well-meaning folks like myself recommend books and you have friends and family members and other podcasts you listen to and they'll recommend books. So now you have by the end of the week, you have five books that you need to read. But here's the problem. You don't have time to sit down and read all the books. Why don't you just listen to the book like you listen to podcasts like this? That is why I recommend Audible. One of the books that I'm listening to now, I told you about it at the beginning of the introduction, is called The 12-Week Year. Get more done in 12 weeks than others do in 12 months by Brian P. Moran. You can listen to the book for free. You can check it out by simply going to audibletrial.com slash TSE. Get one audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible. It's a deal. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash TSE. You're going to absolutely love it. You're going to get through all of your books and you're going to feel so good. <laughs> Again, audibletrial.com slash TSE. We're going to go ahead and dive back into the second half of this episode with my good friend Jim and Marianne. So as you listen to them, I would recommend that you write one of these principles down. If you're driving, just don't worry about writing it down. Go to the show notes. Take one of these principles. Apply it to the way that you sell and you'll see how you become more effective at reading people and having more clarity with your body language. So let's dive back into the episode. Well, let's jump into the second part here. I want to talk a little bit more about the a couple more of these 
sales situation specifically around the ROI and the f- fifth one. I, I, I'm in, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but let's talk about ROI. Why is that sure. part so key, especially in relation to body language for, and to help us improve our selling? Well, the ROA sale is a, is a complex sale because you have to, first off, you have to have a certain amount of information on the cost structure and the revenue stream that, that the organization you're dealing with can expect that they're operating under. What assumptions? So you have to do, you have to build a lot of confidence in your prospect by getting them to divulge information to you on the understanding that they're sharing it with you confidentially, but you can't assist them without the benefit of that information. So building that confidence with them is tremendously important. Once you have that information, then there's some calculations involved in the ROI sale. And what it ultimately amounts to is you're, you need to be able to make a persuasive case if you can, and you never want to try to make it if it's not there, but that by purchasing your product or service, though it may be more expensive than some of the alternatives, ultimately they're going to get a superior return on that investment than some of the less expensive stuff that's there. And, and a, a classic place that this shows up is in anything that's mechanical and has moving parts. You can buy cheap and you can buy expensive. And as we all know, you buy expensive and potentially if you can make the case that the product is going to last longer, the service is going to be superior, such that it either does one of two things, increases revenue or decreases cost or a combination of the two, then you can potentially make that argument that they should spend more with you. One of the best examples that that we came up with when we were writing the book was when a lot of the traffic lights were being transitioned from incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs. And salespeople were coming into these municipalities and saying, I've got a great idea. I've got a light bulb here that costs, I kid you not, 50 to 70 times more than what you're currently paying. Isn't that a great idea? And of course, and if, they, if they even listen to you from that point on, you have to make the point that, but you're going to have, a, it's going to last dramatically longer and you're not going to have nearly as much maintenance costs. And that's where your massive cost is when you send a crew out there to have to change a light and you have to stop traffic and all that kind of stuff. And they go and they could make the ROI argument that by spending dramatically more initially over the life cycle of that product, their costs are lower. Interesting. Right. I did not know that <laughs> with the light bulb, with the you know city appro- approach and the city governments. That's awesome. Wouldn't you love that task to walk in and say, <laughs> Here's a, I've got a product that's 50 times more expensive than what you're currently paying. How many do you want to buy? Get out of here. We ain't got a budget for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, there's a body language angle to this too. Yeah. And this is, here's a hot tip. One of the things that we can notice about other people and like what's going on in the head is a lot of times people will look down and to the left, just down, down left. If they're calculating, it very, it's a very, very common thing that people do. So if you're doing an ROI sale and you see somebody look down to the left, that's good. They're running numbers. Huh. So just, just keep that in mind. What about down, out of curious, down to the right, what's that? <laughs> That is deep emotion. Ah. If you look at people who are going through something like a funeral or some some deep emotional experience, you'll see downright. And I oh, we saw I, I saw this dramatically sitting at the top of some a level of stairs. They were all these kids who were leaving camp, and it was a, a it was chapel. It was their final chapel at summer camp and they were sad to leave. And I saw a lot of downright. And I, since I was sitting up top on these bleachers, I could look down and I could see these kids. And I said, oh, wow, they are really deeply touched by this being their last chapel. Uh, uh, that's, I, it makes sense. And I can, I mean, I guess once you know now, you can look into situations like that and, you know, kind of visually see it, right? And, and, and even yeah. you could see it happening, be like, oh, that's why people do that. Never really thought about that. Right, right. Well, I want now, to go- we're talking about, now we're talking about eye movement like that, Don. I'm going to see if I I'm going to challenge Marianne if it's all right with you. Uh-oh. Can, can you can you provide any insights for Donald and his listeners as to how to readily discern or whether you even can dishonesty and deception? Okay, this is a really really quick one. Eye movement sometimes does reveal whether a person is using imagination or memory. You have to do something called baselining, which means you ask a few questions that are definitely questions that involve memory and then see where do the eyes go? And if they consistently go up left or up right, depending on the person, then the opposite generally is imagination. 
And when you see the eye movement moving toward imag- is indicating imagination, sometimes other elements of body language will reinforce your suspicion that maybe this person is not really telling the whole truth. Mm, eye movement. And so I guess that's why all those FBI shows and stuff like that, they can figure, <laughs> just like read people and see things like that, see how those deceptions are, are happening, right? Well, actually, right, a, a good, a good you have way to be a little pra- careful. <laughs> a, good, a, a good way to practice this in real time when you're not in, in when you're not dealing with actors who are rehearsed is to watch politicians get interviewed. Mm. And <laughs> watch. I'm serious. You watch their eye movement, and once you've had a chance to baseline them, you get a pretty good indication as to whether they're being genuine or not, unless they're truly pathological, which some are. In which case, they can hide that. That's true. Very true. Well, I wonder, before we finish up here, the, the fifth one, the fifth area, I had them written down here. What was that after ROI? I, I can't remember what we had down there, Jim. Fear selling. Fear selling. Let's talk and about fear. <laughs> we kept that last because it's one that we like to try to steer people away from. Fear selling has its place. Obviously, it's focused on convincing people that if they don't make the transaction, they're going to miss an opportunity or they're going to be disadvantaged in some way or another. An example would be, well, you know, three of your competitors have already purchased this. I think you probably don't want to miss this opportunity, things of that sort. The challenge with fear selling is it's tremendously manipulative. And sometimes people feel like they they can quickly sense they're being manipulated. It doesn't make you, mean you won't make the transaction, but it means that you're probably significantly disadvantaging your long-term relationship. You're putting that in jeopardy. And as we all know, as sales professionals, our time is our greatest asset. And life, generally, we don't have enough time to go through all the process of cultivating a client or a prospect and then selling to them a single time. So that's why we try to steer people away from fear selling unless it's absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary. It kind of reminds me of the loss aversion idea where, you know, sometimes you find that people are more afraid of losing something than they're, they care about gaining something. You know, it's the, if I tell you, you know, there's a chance that I can show you how you can save that extra you know, $100 right now from your monthly electricity bill, as opposed to gaining $100, it's this one is easier to keep the money that I'm already losing, as opposed to working and finding something, gaining something new. So, it's, so it's, my, and my question to you, Donald, is if somebody uses that sales approach on, on you afterwards, do you feel like you've been manipulated? It would feel that if, I guess, in, in, if you have the fear side of it, and I guess it really depends, right? If, um, if somebody was trying to and I guess it goes back to the body language and the way they sound. And if it, if it, they do it often, if it see something that's always under, you know, the way that they, they treat people or tell people like, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this. And it's like, uh, maybe not. But if it's in my genuine best interest and, you know, Jim, you're telling me, Donald, you know, if I can show you how this can help you, you know, if you don't do it, then this is what's going to happen. Then it, I would see it maybe like a blend of the expert and the fear. Am I making sense I, of that? Uh- Yes, and I completely agree with you. And, and if it's part of a relationship and a well-established relationship where you can come through the door, you can call on the phone with credibility and say, let me explain something to you. We've got a price increase coming. I'm not supposed to be telling anybody about it. But the reality is you probably want to bulk up on this order because you know that's an example of a fear sale where you're actually serving them well and you're bolstering your relationship. But yeah. you're saying you, you really need to get some more budgetary authority on this because it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you out after the price right. increase. In terms of consumer experience, women are often given the fear sell, you know, buy this cosmetic now because it'll, the price is going to go up tomorrow. Buy this dress now because the price is going to go up tomorrow. Or, you know, it's the whole sale mentality. Gee, I better do that right this minute so that I can, you know, look good uh, or <laughs> you know, whatever. But yeah. women get that constantly. Very interesting stuff. I mean, if there's like, there, there's so many things I think feel we can go and we could talk about, but I want to get from each of you guys just one major takeaway you'd like somebody to leave this episode with regarding the concept of using body language to improve sale. What's that one major piece of advice from each of you? Marianne, do you want to go first? Sure. You want to have the body language of trust because if you want a long term relationship with somebody, you know, a sales interaction that is positive and growing and strong, there must be trust. And so you want open body language. You want to, in some ways, look vulnerable because then somebody, then the person will trust you. You have nothing to hide. When you're an honest person, then somebody's going to want to do business with you again. And my perspective, Donald, as the the sales guy and not the body language expert is, is simply stated, 
you want to be aware from the very beginning of the interaction whether you, the person, the people you're interacting with are open or closed in all the ways that you can interpret that through the signals that we train people about in the book. Just as important, you need to be aware of the fact whether you are being open or you are being closed, and there's an appropriate place for both. I agree with what Marianne's saying. Generally speaking, some openness and vulnerability will, will bolster your credibility just to an extent. But if you look at nothing else but where the, the other people in the room are and you are on the openness to closeness spectrum, that's going to give you a great head start. Excellent. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, if folks out there is listening to this episode and they want to get connected with you guys or to get access to your book, what's the best way or best place for them to go to get access to you guys in your book? Marianne, you want to handle that? Well, the publisher is Red Wheel Wiser, so their website would definitely have our book. Also, the Jim, I think your website probably is a good place. A place to go for information on me and my practice is the risks-institute.com. That's risks, plural, hyphen institute.com. And that has all contact information and so forth. And the book is called Body Language Sales Secrets. It's readily available both as an ebook and a printed book on Amazon and, and uh, Barnes and Noble and all the other classic means by which we buy books in today's world. <laughs> well, thank you guys both so much for being willing to come on the show today. We sure appreciate your insights and the value that you brought to us. And, and I hope that, uh, well, I know that there's some, someone listening to the show is going into an appointment and they're going to perform better just because of some of the things that you shared today. So thank you so much. That's thank a great you, thought. Donald. Thank and you. And Donald, don't lose that warmth. I won't. That's right. (laughs) Thank you both. Thanks, guy. Thank you. Bye-bye. A must-read book. I recommend you to check it out. If you want to find the details of it, the body language sales secret, just simply go to the show notes of this episode, thesalesevangelist.com slash the word episode number 753. Again, thesalesevangelist.com slash the word episode number 753. You will absolutely love it. I'm telling you, Jim and Marianne, they're a dynamic duo sharing all kinds of great goodness. And uh, you'll realize that there's a hidden language that we tend to overlook as sales professional. I do all these things because I really want to help you. I recommend books like this. I recommend Audible. I bring guests on the podcast like this. We have Facebook Live. We have our Facebook group. We have our training programs. We have everything here because we are determined to help new and struggling sellers, help sellers and sales leaders like to perform well. If this sounds like a friend that you have, I would ask that you go ahead and tell them about what we're doing. Share the wealth, right? Let's grow this community. Let's help other salespeople. Let's fulfill this mission of helping everyone to perform well to the best of their abilities. Again, I do this stuff because I love it and I care for you. I love you. I want you to perform well. I want you to be happy. I want you to be successful. But most importantly, I want you to go out each and every day and do big things. 